stories don't define you. How you tell them will. Hi, I'm Sarah Elkins, your host and chief story maker of Elkins Consulting. We share stories for many reasons, to persuade, to entertain, to connect. What we sometimes forget is the impact of the stories we tell ourselves. Whether you're sharing personal stories or business stories, how you share them makes a difference in how you remember them and in how you're perceived by the people you're interacting with. When you figure out which stories to share, difficult bosses and coworkers, successes, failures, the next step is to develop how you share them. Have you figured out your patterns, your roles in those successes, the discomfort and your challenges? In this series, you'll hear stories that will resonate with you. You'll nod your head in understanding, and then we'll dig into the lessons from each of those. How many times have you been sharing a story only to be interrupted by a person eager to share his own? When I'm working with clients on communication skills, I remind them to listen for understanding, not to respond. But during this podcast, I'm asking you to listen and consider your own related stories, to listen and consider which stories in your life might have impacted you in a similar way. It's another living room couch episode of Your Stories Don't Define You, How You Tell Them Will. And today I am fortunate to be sitting here with my friend Rocky Cannell. And Rocky and I met at the Helena Airport, which is funny because anytime I go to the Helena Airport, I usually run into a bunch of people I know. And very rarely do I meet someone new at the Helena Airport because it's such a small town. So um, I invited Rocky to join me today, and as always, I'm going to ask him to share something about himself that most people don't know. Rocky? Sarah, um, yeah, meeting you at the airport, I, I went from being um, just isolated in my own little world to a celebrity when you found out that I made the baguettes that, that, you're, <laughs> that you're a fan of, so that... It made my day and made my trip for sure. It was a, <laughs> it was a fun connection to make. Um, there was something somebody that most people don't know about me. My father was a veterinarian uh, up in Glasgow, Montana. So we traveled all over the state. Uh, he had an airplane. We'd actually fly down onto ranches and, and uh, you know, pregnancy test and all this stuff. So one of my earliest jobs, and I'm going to try to just keep this as clean as possible. But <laughs> one of my earliest jobs that I, you know, was good at was collecting bull semen. Oh no! <laughs> and this is something as a little kid, I just did because it was one of the jobs we had to do when we do bull testing. And I didn't realize how bizarre it was until I took a friend, like when I was 14 or 15 and said, Hey, come out and work with us. You'll get paid. It'll be great. And then we can go, you know, mess around afterwards or whatever. Well, I remember Scott came and we kind of got set up and put a bull through the chute. You know, and these are, I don't know, 2,000 pound animals, you know, <laughs> mean as hell. And you're putting them in the thing. And without getting graphic about how we collect this, um, my friend Scott was just standing there and he was just um, kind of horrified. <laughs> and I'd never thought about it before, right? Because I just grew up doing this, it, you know. Does it involve a needle? No, nope, it involves a probe. Like a, a probe that you insert into the bull, and the bull leaves is a very happy bull. So it's <laughs> like it, it, you're basically, you know, helping this bull, you know, stimulating it to the point of ejaculation. Having an and, orgasm. And having an orgasm. And so getting them in the chute was difficult, even more difficult to get them out of the chute because they'd <laughs> collapse in the chute, and they were just like, oh my God. And so you'd kind of have to send them out with a cigarette or whatever. You know, <laughs> after you'd looked at the sperm to see if it's viable, to see if it's, you know, so that was a lot of my dad's job early on in the, you know, 70s and 80s, just traveling around Montana doing that constantly. So Okay, that is the most unusual, <laughs> something I don't know about right. you story I have heard yet. In almost 80 episodes, that is probably the most unusual job I have heard yet. I, I was trying to think of something surprising, and that's <laughs> one of those uh, dinner party stories that 
<laughs> that gets me in trouble. So. That's awesome. <laughs> no, it's a great story. And one of these days, I'm going to have to look it up on YouTube because now I'm really curious about stimulating a bowl to erection well, can, and well, ejaculation. I can tell you exactly how it's done. That's not, I don't think, the intention of the podcast. But the, <laughs> no. Um, yeah, and it's something that's done, you know, there's great work being done around the world, you know, where they have to collect collect it from rare species, you know, black rhinos and elephants and things like that. And the techniques are always very interesting because <laughs> it's, it's a job, you know, I'm, I'm, it's a job nobody really wants to have to do. But um, and it's, it's interesting, you know, when you're controlling the reproductive systems of these amazing animals and cattle are amazing animals. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, it was a fascinating thing to grow up doing. And until I was like 15 years old, I never really thought about what we were actually doing. And the, the, the light bulb kind of went off. So. Like, oh my. <laughs> right. Come on, come on, Scott, grab the cup. You have to catch it in the cup. So. Yeah. I can just imagine poor Scott. Oh, Did Scott. he ever talk to you again? Scott, yeah, our, our relationship, we'll have to look him up. I know he's selling real estate in Chicago now. I'll have to ask him. What he remembers of that story. Because what happened afterward? Did he catch it in the cup? Or oh, did yeah. He walk I, mean, away? I, think, I think he worked worked with us that day. I mean, it's fairly shocking, right? You're to be doing this. It's uh, just raw sexuality. Um, and it's interesting. You know, that's what, you know, a whole economy is based on. <laughs> and uh, you didn't even just, think to tell him what he was going to be doing in that way. No, because it was it just, just one was of so many jobs you. that you'd do, right? You'd be, whether, you know, everything from, you know, pregnancy testing was another thing. So my dad had his arm up the rear end of cattle um, for most of his career as a veterinarian because he, you know, would just do hundreds and hundreds of head a day, you know, pregnancy testing to see if you'd want to send them into this pasture or keep, you know, whatever. Right. And so, that was fascinating. And especially when, you know, when some of those bulls and some of that semen is worth is gold, it's literally liquid gold. Um, you know, it'd be sold around the world, you know, and back in the eighties during the cattle boom. And I think there's another cattle boom going on now. I'm not yeah. sure, but yeah. the, uh, yeah, it's liquid gold wow. know, from, these, <laughs> from these prize bulls. From, That's so amazing. I don't put that not. on my resume. I've always thought about it. Like I should put that on my, <laughs> on my CV. Or well, whatever. it definitely doesn't go with your uh, job as a baker right now as an artis- right. artisanal artisanal bread baker so yeah. no i don't think i don't think people would i think it would create <laughs> it would a weird, a weird associ- <laughs> association with my bread yeah, yeah. oh gross right. <laughs> so yeah. for our listeners um the reason rocky brought this up when we first met uh, about when we first met was that um, he has perfected the french baguette here in helena montana and the reason that's a big deal other than the fact that it, bread is just something so important in in my life and in, in my husband's life. We look for really good bread. It's something that's part of our, um, I don't know, our satisfaction in life is eating really high-end delicious bread. And finding it in Montana is tricky. And we've spent a couple of trips in Europe just exploring and eating all different kinds of bread And I found out that Rocky was the one who had perfected this French baguette that we had been buying for a few months and just being so thrilled to get real bread here in Helena, Montana. And perfecting it is no small feat, partly because we're at high altitude. We're at almost 5,000 feet. And finding a recipe or perfecting a recipe that addresses that altitude is is tricky. Mm. So. So our listeners have some context for, for why I wanted to talk to you. And, the, you know, the story of that baguette is a great story. I make two different baguettes, and it's been my favorite thing ever. To me, a, a baguette is a true test of a baker um, because it's four ingredients, you know, water, flour, salt, and yeast. And if you stay to that, you know, you can get – you can do whole grains and things like that. But if you just stay to those four simple ingredients, 
I can go anywhere in the world and have a baguette. And to me, it represents that baker's expression of that puzzle right and so and it you know ultimately takes about three days to make and the new one that we have that's just our french baguette is just a one i mean it's a wonderful story in of itself because you know one of the things when you're doing when you're doing commercial baking i mean if i could do anything i wanted i would just be baking right but i i'm a manager and i and so i have to have a whole team that does this. And really, I think when you're working with bread, it's, I think you're working for the bread. I think that's the best way to put it. You, you, anything else you can make recipes and you can do it very mechanically, but bread is its own entity. And so getting a team of people to create a consistent product and it's never the same. All the conditions are always changing. The bread's always changing. This particular baguette, I'm super proud of. I don't think there's, in fact, I think the way we do it is quirky enough that it might be the only one made like this in the in the world. I mean, um, but it was just I got a wild hair uh, before Thanksgiving. I think the day before Thanksgiving, one of, or the, a couple days before Thanksgiving, I had a wild hair that I wanted to try. I'd been thinking about for a long time, and my team had kind of helped me figure some things out we were trying to unlock the puzzle of this french dough um just couldn't get any flavor out of it and i uh, had this wild hair and and so this baguette is uh, a pate fermenté baguette so what it instead of being fed with a starter normally you create a starter which is um like where you create a lot of yeast activity and then add that to the to the flour and water to you know, make it come to life. What we do instead of a starter is use old dough. So pate fermenté is basically the French term for old dough. And so our baguette, it's very kind of maternal in a way, or, you know, it, 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 today's baguette is fed by, so let's say to, you know, today is Monday. Today's baguette was, is fed with, Friday and Saturday's baguette and today's baguette will feed Thursday or Wednesday and Thursday's baguette. So there's a continuity. We're building layers of, of dough and Mm -hmm. and this is done by a team and we have this kind of complex formula, but it's super simple. We're just taking old dough, adding it in proportion in a right portion to the, to the recipe and we're creating this baguette that's fed by the old ones and is feeding the future ones. So I love the concept to me. It's just the, one of the sexiest breads I've ever made. And the great (laughs) thing about it is, is that it, um, is that it just unlocks all the natural sweetness. Like the, the, there are days that it's better than others, you know, and it's the weird frustrating part of bread Mm-hmm. No matter how perfect we do it, and no matter how consistent we are, we it's always changing. But there there was a couple of days last week where it was it almost brought me to tears because it was so beautiful. It was just so perfect and, and it was, so delicious. Right? The smell. I think that's the beauty of bread. There's so much to it that um, I I wouldn't even risk baking bread for a, a long time just for that reason because I was so intimidated by it. My mom taught me how to make challah, the Jewish braided bread that we serve on the Sabbath on Friday and Saturday, many years ago in Colorado. So we did it at high altitude. And I made it a few times when I was in college, when I was teaching Sunday school, I made it with my class a couple Mm -hmm. times and it it was successful. But then I moved to Washington, D.C. out of college and didn't make it the time that I lived there. And then we moved here to Montana, and I remember the the first time trying to make it at high altitude again, and I failed miserably. Mm. And I made the dough, and um, it came out as little bricks. It didn't (laughs) rise at all. It was just, and literally the dog wouldn't even eat it. It was that hard. Mm. And But I had cut the dough in half, and the other half, I saved, and the the next day I made sticky buns. I rolled it out, 
added brown sugar, cinnamon, um, nuts and raisins or whatever, craisins. I don't like raisins in my bread, but I like craisins in it because they don't get all plump and weird texture. I know that's something our listeners really appreciate hearing. Um, but, (laughs) and then I, I, like I said, I rolled it out and I put these toppings in and I melted brown sugar and butter in the bottom of a, a pie pan, pie plate, rolled up that dough with the, the filling in it and sliced it up and put it in the pie plate and baked it. And then I flipped it over when it was baked. And so all the, the caramel from the melted brown mm-hmm. sugar and butter was mm-hmm. all drizzled throughout the, the, the rolls. It was amazing. Like those... Those sticky buns were a, a new addition to our tradition in our household, and I just made them last weekend again, 20 years later. That's they have they've stuck. Those sticky buns stuck. Mm-hmm. So the next week, I decided to try and make it again, and um, my husband said, "Oh yeah, of course, you know, go ahead, try it again." Mostly, he was excited because he knew I'd have the other half of the dough to make sticky buns again. But again, it came out wrong. It had overrisen once I had braided it. And then when I went to bake it, it collapsed. So it was big flat braids and it tasted good, but it wasn't pretty and the texture was wrong. And I remember almost giving up. And when you say there are so many different moving parts when you're baking bread, what I was thinking about was the fact that one week it could be somewhat humid here and the next week it could be so dry that your eyes start to ache. And I'm sure that contributes to that. Challenge. I can't even imagine baking bread in a humid. I've only baked in Montana. I've lived all over the country, but never baked. When I lived in New York, I didn't bake yet. When I lived in Florida, I wasn't baking um, so I've only worked in Montana and it's always a pain in the butt because it's so dry, right? Mm-hmm. I'm, I use a spray bottle constantly with my bread cause it's just constantly getting a skin on it. And yeah, but those are the challenges, you know, the, the, and I think that's what makes bread so unique is that it's so sensitive to the environment. So you're really create, I mean, you're creating this, if it's not a living thing exactly, it is an artificial life form because it is this thing that, you know, I, I've always said, I've always told my bakers, we're more like cowboys than anything. You're, you're wrestling this dough, you know, where it's a, it's a demanding job and it's a different thing. You know, right now I'm, I've got this great guy that was a sous chef in Missoula for, you know, 10 years and he's really having trouble getting it because it's not a, you know, you can't just crank out a formula and I'm trying to teach him feel and things like that. And it's beautiful to watch that come alive. I think that's what I like the most about baking bread now is watching people get those aha moments where, because it's really not about what's in your head. You can teach all that stuff, but it's, it's about feel it's about intuition, um, and that's the kind of baker I am. I can't, you know, I could tell you some of the science because I've been around it a long time, but my passion, you know, this is how I make a living, but, you know, my passion is really philosophy and psychology and animal training and things like this. So the, I, and I think the bread got me there because it, um, it helped deepen my intuition. I know when something's ready. I know, I, I just know things, <laughs> you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And, uh, and so then when I started getting into animal training, I just had something that nobody else had. I could read, you know, specifically these golden eagles I'd work with, uh, you know, I could read subtleties that I could feel, but I have no idea how I could feel. And my, you know, there's great stories of, you know, moments of breakthroughs with a wild animal of where trust is built. And I, oddly enough, I think it comes down to bread. I, I got into bread originally. I was going through a divorce and I needed something different. I wanted to get out of my head. I got this job at this little bakery in Billings called Poet Street Market. No longer exists, but it was like anybody that lives in Billings, you know, knows, knew it at the time. It was great. 
And I became their bread baker with no knowledge except that I love to make pizza dough, like, like you do. <laughs> yes, I That's do. another thing we have in common. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just love, like, I was always chasing the perfect pizza crust because I'd lived out in New York and I'd had great pizza and I moved back to Montana and I couldn't, couldn't have, find right? good pizza. So I was like, I'm going to yeah. make the best pizza. You That's know? exactly why we installed a wood burning pizza oven in yeah. our yard because we were so dissatisfied with any of the pizza we That's could our try. next podcast. If this one's popular enough, our next one's going to be making dough and baking in that oven. I just saw it. It's beautiful. <laughs> yes, <It'll> be definitely. <laughs> this is Rocky's first time in my house. Um, and for our listeners, a little bit of background. When uh, Rocky and I talk and we meet um, almost every week, we take our dogs to the same watering hole and let the dogs go run together. And almost every week we talk about bread baking. And though bread baking hasn't been a huge part of my life, I certainly don't do it professionally. It has always held um, an important role in my life and in my family's life. As I mentioned, my mom taught me how to make challah and she would make fresh challah when I was a kid, almost every Friday. And I remember the smell as I came home. I remember feeling nurtured when I could smell that challah in the oven, no matter what else was going on in our lives, even through, um, you know, the difficulties in my parents' marriage and eventual divorce, through all kinds of um, issues with depression in my family directly and my extended family, I always felt loved and nurtured when I would walk into the house and smell that fresh baking bread. And um, I have created that in our home as well. My kids, they, they come into the house and they smell that bread baking. And no matter how hard a day they've had, they can't help but walk in and smile. And um, so when Rocky and I talk about baking bread, we talk about the fact that it's so, such a good analogy for everything else in our lives. We infuse our energy into our bread when we're baking it. And especially if it's the kind of bread that takes kneading and you have to touch it, you have to feel it. You can't do that with gloves on. You can't feel where the dough needs to be um, without really having a sense of it and and infusing your energy in it. And the last time we talked about this, we talked about how to share this with one of your employees, that everything we do, we infuse our energy into, not just bread. And when we can be intentional about understanding where we want the outcome to be, then we can choose the energy that's the input. It's a, you know, it's a fascinating thing because there's three things about that tie into this, three things about bread that are just I think is true about us as well. I, bread to me is not a product. It's not a thing that's you know sold on the shelf or something that you slice on the table. It, that's only part of it. To me, bread is a process and, and not a product. And I think we are too. And that's how I think of myself. I'm a mm-hmm. I'm just the world rocking. You know, you're the world serrating, right? your event happening and at what point, you know, in that evolution do you say is the magic moment, you know, you, you know, it's all one part of it. And, and it's also a conversation, right? It's like, I'm having a conversation with the farmer that grew it with the, you know, with the, that grew the wheat. I'm having a conversation with the kind of technology and things and the customers and then they're taking it home and they're creating conversation the word companion means the person that you break bread with right it's so central and what you're saying about your experience of bread i think is you know central to civilization that bread represents the fire the hearth the the communal place like scoring bread used to be, you know, you you used to have a specific family score or whatever, and you'd bring the bread to the village baker. There was a, a, a an oven, you know, there could, it only a made sense. A communal oven. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they'd go and you'd bake your bread and your score would be on it. And you'd know that that was your bread and come pick it up later. Right. And like after it was baked and it's such a great idea. We've <laughs> a few bakers in town. There's a, just a few of us, but we've talked about how fun that would be to do something like that. <laughs> that that's accurate. I like that. 
I like the idea that um, it's a process and there are so many stories involved in bread and there's a reason we call it breaking bread together and not sitting down to a meal together. Right. And um, there's a reason there's a, the Jewish tradition of the Sabbath, the Shabbat, is that um, we we say a prayer over bread and it's a it's a prayer of gratitude. It's yeah. not a, a it's not a prayer of asking for something. It's a prayer of gratitude. Yeah. And when I think about the the stories my children will tell about having this fresh baked challah in in their house, and their friends will be able to tell the ones that have sat at our table. And um, I I would love to hear a story that you have about that first time you realized that bread was nurturing and nourishing a, a part of you or somebody that you cared about. Interesting. I mean, I, you know, the, the first moment that came to mind, one of my favorite doughs early on and still is, we have to make it in such vast quantities. It, it sometimes loses its, its uh, appeal because it's at the end of a eight hour day or whatever that we that we finally divide up the ciabatta but ciabatta is such a beautiful simple bread it's it's light it's high hydration very wet you're constantly folding it to create the structure it means an italian slipper it's slipper bread so it's kind of a long supposed to look like a, a slipper essentially and i remember for some reason you know, I don't know why bread called me. I needed a job, but um, getting into that, I loved making the chib- the ciabatta more than anything. And I remember a guy came in one time and that bakery was open so you could see me baking. And usually when it opened up and people would come in and get coffees and maybe sandwiches for later in the day, I was finishing up and, uh, you know, you get there before the sun comes up and, you know, you're usually getting done when people are getting started. So I remember I came in and bought all my loaves of ciabatta one day and I was just like, you know, I just put it out. It was just fresh out of the oven and we had it in the basket. And and he just told me how much he enjoyed, like every time he'd go up and see his son in Great Falls, he he, he loved our ciabatta so much, you know, that he'd take it and bring it up to his family and they put it in the freezer because they loved it so much. Right. And, and it was just this feeling of like, um, I, I felt so selfish about that bread because it was a meditation for me. Right. Bread to me is a meditation and I teach, I don't teach it this way, but you know, I do as well. I mean, it's a lot like yoga. It's a practice. It's something you go do, and get better at and better at and you, you know it it takes years to get good at making bread on the scale we make it and um i just i remember feeling selfish about that bread and feeling like i, I did that for the joy of it right that was kind of my guilty pleasure was folding this ciabatta and shaping it and throwing it in the oven and that it was for you yeah, I, 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 it didn't occur to me but there was something about this guy kind of buying it all and 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 that he'd he'd somehow seen the change, you know, in the past few months to the point that when he brought some the last time to Great Falls, they said, would you bring more? More. And so he bought it all. And I don't know, it, it, it helped me just that thing. Of, I don't know about it. You know, I'm kind of a, a skeptic in a way about intentionality. Do Does our energy infuse? I think so. The, the complexities of how that happens when there's so many variables at play. But when I go back to that moment, I definitely, you know, remember like that feeling of connection to, you know, my most inner as I'm healing my life, as I'm putting my life back together, as I'm trying to figure it out. And, you know, and then suddenly it's connecting this man to his son up in, you know, in another part of the country. Mm-hmm. So that was great. And I think that was a moment that really stands out. I miss having those interactions with customers because, yeah, that's just one part of the process. Selling the bread is just one part of that process. It's mm-hmm. really where it's going. And and so it does help me to know that our crew is 
loving what they do and that they find joy in what they do. And it's not just a job, right? Mm -hmm. There's a, and because it's so difficult, you know, it's one out of one. If if there's one day a month that things turn out great, that's amazing. But usually one thing turns out great. One thing, not so great. You're always chasing the great loaf of bread, right? But Mm -hmm. what I do on my Fridays are kind of a gift I give myself. So I make a, I make a three loaves that are kind of my favorites. I make the big sky, I'm, I'm, the Big Sky Country, which is tar- a tartine loaf from S- San Francisco, very light, beautiful bread. Um, and that's I, that starts at 4 o'clock in the morning and gets out of the oven at about 1.30. It's just the entire process. And But I do this one called the Black and Brie, which is my tribute or kind of my nod to the baguette. I, I wanted to create the perfect baguette. It's just something... You know, it's like the Holy Grail, you know, Mm -hmm. of to not not to make the perfect baguette, but to make my best expression of the baguette. Right. Right. That I would put against anybody's. I finally created one that I was super happy with and I only make it on the weekends. It's made with a wild yeast um, uh, rather than. a commercial yeast. Well, it does have some commercial yeast in it because it has a poolish, but it has a wild yeast that we kind of captured and trained, as I like to think, um, <laughs> about a year ago. And it's a, it's a different baguette than our French baguette. And um, but what I do to this baguette is I then put uh, edible charcoal, food grade charcoal, in the water so it turns everything black. And then I roll brie cheese in it. And I love this because it's a 10 hour day for me. It's Friday. So we're just, things are, you know, it's crazy. But at the end of my, the end of my day is making that baguette, shaping it, letting it proof for an hour, hour and a half, and then baking it off. And, and, you know, there's beautiful people in this town that, you know, it's got a little cult following and stuff. And Mm -hmm. that just means the world to me. You know, when I, I've gone into a brewery, you know, I think I was walked into 10 Mile Creek and there was a guy sitting there eating his black and brie with a beer. And, you know, that's to me the <laughs> ultimate accomplishment, you know, as a baker, I can't imagine anything else because that was something I dreamed up. I wanted to create something that when you cut open, it looked so so different and contrary that it made you look at the crumb, made you consider all these things. It doesn't taste any different. There's a slight difference, but it's more just about the experience of uh, the the possibility of re-experiencing something that's so familiar so that Mm -hmm. you could awaken something. uh, Yeah. It awakens Mm -hmm. and and kind of makes you want to know what a baguette is again. Mm -hmm. So I want to go back to the story about it was the bakery in Billings, right? Uh Where that guy did that. Because when you think back on that time and he bought it, I get the impression that your initial thought was a little um, a, a little frustrated almost that he bought all of them. Right. Because you, like you said, you were selfish about it. You're like, well, now nobody else is going to get it. Right. And I spent all that time making it. Right. But then that, that trigger when he told you that he was bringing it up to his son in Great Falls, you may not have known this at that time. But now that you look back on it, you became part of a tradition for that family. And it's, it's kind of part of your legacy for that family that their son probably now says, Oh, we used to get this amazing ciabatta from Billings and that bakery holds a different place in his memory and probably in the memories of his children than it would have had his father not discovered what you were putting into this bread. And that's the other thing I love about bread. You're also having a conversation with history. Like, mm-hmm. so one of the great things about the baguette is, like, you know, it's the French perfected it over hundreds of years. So it, I'm just a part of a tradition. Mm-hmm. And um, all of these breads, you know, it does go back to the beginning of civilization and it does, you know, mean a lot to me, but also just the idea right, of creating something and the bread can still have that intimate mm-hmm. 
you know, connecting, yeah, right. connecting families and connecting mm-hmm. people. It's not it's unlike, very real. it's not unlike storytelling and music right. through the ages of knowing that when I'm singing a, a Hebrew song to my boys, that I'm continuing a tradition. We're not a religious family, but I know that I'm part of this history right. that I am passing along to future generations. And, and even when I'm just performing like, um, on July 4th, performing with a jazz quintet and I'll be singing uh, America the Beautiful and uh, mostly just jazz classics. And I think about how that tradition just gets carried along from generation to generation and that you're part of something much bigger than yourself. And I think that's the great thing about bread. I do two things. So my son and I are also falconers and falconry is uh, the United Nations declared it a, a part of the human heritage it's like a you know it goes back you know as far as we know to the beginnings of civilization these relationships that people have had with with animals but it's only been passed on through apprenticeships and mentoring and that's still the process today you have to have a two-year apprenticeship to become a falconer and i have i have mentors around the country around the world actually now as far as falconry goes and bread is the same thing like the relationships that i have to have i'm still learning now because i i still i'm you know i think i'm kind of a selfish baker in a way like i'd rather just bake bread you know (laughs) from for myself i'd rather just bake beautiful bread but i'm you know i'm had this great synchronicity in my life. This one stormy day that I drove up and met uh, Renee and Johnny Kowalski. And, you know, you don't meet many people that they're the owners of uh, Park Avenue Bakery. And rarely will you meet people where it's just kind of instantaneous, like, oh, okay, I'm going to work for you guys. And that's just the way it's going to be. <laughs> yeah, right. right. And they thought so too. And, I think the thing I'm having to grow as a baker now, I think I've been doing it 12 years as a baker. Now I'm, I have to grow into being a mentor, a mentor more mm-hmm. than the baker. And, and everybody's different. Some people have a natural feel for it and can get it right off the bat. Other people, myself included, I, there, there's some things that were really difficult about bread, but when it clicks, it clicks. And, you know, so everybody's different and everybody learning to have a, a relationship to this thing that's, you know, and I don't spout any of my philosophy. Or I try not to to people because I don't I really want people to discover their own relationship to this so that they can have those similar mm-hmm. experiences. You know, and I think, you know, the other thing I fell in love with when I moved there or when I looked at moving here. I just finished up a job in Florida. I was working for one of the great animal trainers named Steve Martin out of Orlando, Florida, and and his company trains birds for Disney shows and shows all over the world. Fascinating stuff. Not my, not my future, uh, not my cup of tea exactly doing that, but I learned a lot and I learned how much I love Montana by living in Florida on my return. (laughs) I was kind of, back home, hanging out with my parents, looking for the next place to kind of be and saw this notice in the Bread Baker's Guild of America, a national thing, that they were looking for a spot. I always wanted to move to Helena because it's so central and it's still Montana. I'd lived in Bozeman five years previous. I was working at the Bozeman Community Food Co-op, which is was a wonderful place to mm-hmm. learn a lot about bread. And we did some amazing things there. Um, I helped develop a really neat program that st- is still in place today. But um, when I got here, it was a, a whiteout d- day in October, just one of those brutal storms that you couldn't even see the truck in front of you. Uh, my friend and I got here, met Johnny and Renee, but what I loved was this oven that they brought in from Italy. And I there's something mm-hmm. about ovens that, you know, is just so powerful. This thing's a monster. And I could just tell that they were, it was like using a Porsche to deliver 
pizzas, right? Like <laughs> they weren't using the potential of this thing and it was three years old, which basically made it feel like it was brand new because mm-hmm. it had been broken in enough. And right. So yeah, we have this amazing oven and boy, throwing these works of, you know, that that a crew of four people have taken three days and the end result is shaping this thing, scoring this thing, and throwing it in this oven, you know, the, that grand moment. And they were really smart the way they did it. They made it so that you can see when you walk in there, you can see the baker baking the bread. And, mm-hmm. and I think it's that's fun. It's fun that we can share that. The whole process is something that we kind of do in the back and something – you know, at this point, as I learned to mentor, but I, I will learn to, you know, do find different ways of experiencing and sharing that. But it's fun for the for this young guy to kind of be out there and and you'll feel all the people watching you. As you you're know, pulling bread out of the oven. As you're pulling bread out of the oven, you can feel uh-huh. people watching you. And sometimes you'll turn to look and, it'll, you know, they don't. It's a little startling. It, it's a little <laughs> startling. And they get startled too because they th- they kind of think they're like watching, they're looking into some secret thing. It does yeah. it does bring up just some primal thing. It's it's fascinating. Mm-hmm. It's fire, and that's the great thing is it's the the primal elements. You're dealing with fire, water, earth, and air, and so it's really the thing that makes bread bread is the air inside that you're creating these gases right. that make it rise, and that's what makes bread. Which is part of what makes it so tricky because there's no control feature. Right. I mean, there really isn't. You just kind of sparked some ideas in my head about analogies and bread baking and and how we infuse our our love and ourselves into whatever we're doing. And it reminded me of that um, book and movie like Water for Chocolate Mm. where the, the woman cooks her emotions <laughs> into great. bakes and cooks her emotions into her food. And there's one scene and I'll share this in the blog post with this podcast. There's one scene where she's making something with, uh, for a wedding that she should have married this man. And it ends up being her sister marrying the man. And she cries her bitter tears into the food. And as they're all eating it at the reception, they're, they're moaning over how delicious it is. And then they all start getting sick and crying. They're all un- uncontrollably crying. And even though that's a slight exaggeration <laughs> for what would happen if you infused sadness into your food, I don't think that it is an um, outrageous exaggeration. Mm. Because I do know that when I am cooking or baking and I'm in that place where I'm feeling the food, understanding the food, choosing the ingredients with intention and going out to my garden to pick sage to make brown butter and sage, um, when I'm doing that and I'm energized by it, it always turns out good, Mm -hmm. even if I'm totally making it up. fly by the seat of my pants kind of doing it. And when I'm not intentional with it, when I'm throwing something together because I'm in a hurry and this just is going to, it'll be fine. It'll be edible. Mm -hmm. And every time I do that, my family says, Oh, this is, it's edible mom. (laughs) And Bob will say, please don't make this again. (laughs) (laughs) It's a constant question to me because my my undergrad and some of my grad school stuff is in philosophy and in depth psychology. The, this you know, so I'm always curious what is true and and there's so many intangibles that go into this. So it is certainly true in a kind of blanket statement that that happens that my my intention, um, unconsciously, my unconscious intention is being transferred, whether it's just through the flow experience and the fact that these million little things that I have to be constantly aware of, I'm less aware of because I'm not present. Right. Right. Or, but I think there is more to that. Because, you know, I, I, I've never asked anybody to, you know, go in with intention 
you know, let's, here's our mantra for the day or whatever. I've thought about it. And I, but I also, I'm, I'm shy about that because there's just so much work to do. Like it is, you know, we're lifting 50 pound bags of dough. We're lifting 150 pound tubs of dough up onto the table. So the, and our timing when you're dealing with, you know, all these different doughs that are that are engine that we've had to engineer to be ready at certain times, and we only have so much cooler space, and we only have so much proofer space and oven space. All this kind of orchestration that happens, you know, that's kind of what goes on on the outside while on the inside, we're also trying to like get so good at this guys that then you can go into that place where your joy and your, Mm -hmm. you get to do the things that you love to do, even though you have to work your ass off to do it. But it's, you know, so true. I, it's, it's funny because I think some people that might come into the bakery or some people that work at the bakery or have worked at the bakery might think, wow, Rocky is absolutely full of shit. He's always, he's he's kind of upset a lot of the time. He's yelling at people. So, so this idea, so, so a lot of people will see me and see a, fr- a frustration, but there's a kind of a maternal aspect of me when I'm there that I have to kind of oversee this thing. And there's things like, oven temperature i'm my i have pet peeves i've don't open my oven like just don't open my oven if somebody peeks in the oven or like the front counter people bless their souls they work their butt off but sometimes somebody will want a piece of pizza heated up or something and they'll go throw it in the oven without asking me Uh and so i you know a lot of people are scared of me now because i just you know i didn't mean to chew chew them out but i am so it's like nurturing and protecting these babies and, and not wanting my oven temperature to be uneven and things like this and so i'm constantly kind of fighting the battle of of you know i feel like a mother bear sometimes mm-hmm. you know having to protect this process from, from you know, sheer ignorance like sometimes they'll open up the front door and let cool air in and it's like i love a kind of a warm humid bakery because the bread loves it right? right of course but then sometimes somebody up front decides they're too hot so they'll open up all the windows and everything and and, and it changes and, out and, oh, everything yeah, everything changes and so then everything slows down and uh-huh. right and and so yeah so my point is is i'm trying to make an excuse for why i'm kind of a bear a lot of the time, but what also it? it's a, it's about teaching people like th- you got, when you care for some tough love mm-hmm. or the protective. But what if you do part. talk to them about the philosophy and the, the impact of every environmental factor on the bread? And I, I say that because um, sometimes when I'm hosting a workshop, I will have everybody take the first few minutes write down a list of whatever is on in their heads, hmm. all the errands they forgot to run, all those tasks, yeah. the, the to-do list. I was supposed to call my mother today. That, that stuff that is the hamster wheel in your head of spinning, I have them write these things down first. Hmm. And then I have them take a moment and do a couple of deep breaths in and out. It's not too touchy-feely. I'm not a touchy-feely person. But it is a way of recentering ourselves and setting intentions for that day to say, okay, right now I am here, I am present. I know that everything I do, every movement I make has an impact on my environment and therefore the products of my environment. That's where I definitely need to become or I guess I'm thinking in that sense now I I need to become more of the manager mentor type because you know our bakery employs 30 some people it's crazy you know it's it's a big small bakery and and then you have the front counter staff young people you know and you're always different people doing different things and so in the beginning I was educating I was trying to help them understand that process I need to do that again because it's you know, with the turnover and everything else, it's all. And it's worth that investment of time if you do it sure. regularly. 
if it's part of your schedule. Sure. I find that um, when I make that investment, I don't I don't want to waste even a moment of my time when I'm doing a workshop because there's so much information to be shared and applied and and learned for for mm, improvement. That's a great and, point. But if I don't set it up in those first few minutes, then I lose other opportunities within that room. So it's just something that I think about a lot. It's you know it's funny. The one thing I really want to push for is getting everybody that works at that bakery in working with bread for one day. Because perception is, it looks like we're a bunch of people playing with dough all the time. Reality is, it's so freaking hard. Like making a baguette is not an easy thing. And to do it, do consistent shapes, you know, you a hundred right. plus of them and do them in a timely manner and all those things. You know, it, it's just something that has to be experienced more than it can be really transferred, you know. But at the same time, usually for people, a, a few after trying to shape a few, then suddenly there's like, oh, wow, this is not what, okay. we, had, we, what we thought it was. Um, that's funny you say that because uh, we talked about this one time during one of our conversations about um, you've done a workshop where you people from the public can sign up and pay for a, a two or three hour bread baking workshop. Right. And you said when they leave, they have a new appreciation for what we do. And I associated that with um, clay. Right. And um, I had a studio within a co-op space at the Clay Arts Guild of Helena for 13 years. And I remember before I started working with clay, I would look at, I'd go to the farmer's market and I'd see mugs or small bowls and think, oh my gosh, $12, $25 for these, a $24 mug, really, it seemed absurd until I got in there and started making my own. And I realized how much goes into making a mug or making a bowl from clay and all the time and effort it takes. But on top of that, the many years that you've put into becoming good at it. So even if it only takes you five minutes to make that mug that's a combination it takes a lot more than five minutes by the way but it it's the the years of dedication to your craft that you're paying for for that mug not the time it took for somebody to make it and that's a tough thing with bread you know in you know in france the baguette is like legally protected right right the the size the weight how many i think even how many scores but even the price was regulated to make sure that people could afford they have full access to it because that's their culture right yeah and so there's a tradition with bread to try to um keep you know it we don't want it to be too expensive we want people to enjoy it so bread is a hard way to make a living it's hard to actually make money on it it, you know, it's to me, not it's more a big profit margin. Right, but it's more it, it's value added. Mm-hmm. If you you can make sandwiches with it, you can okay. do other things with it that can definitely create it. To me, it's yeah, it's a it's a luxury to be able to create bread in today's world when there's so much available. You know, you can for go cheap. for very right. cheap that it's mass produced. You know, and good breads. There's some breads that I dig. You know, Dave's dangerous what's it called dave's killer bread Mm -hmm. is fun you know and Uh that whole company to do things commercially i don't i don't uh i was eating a i was eating a microwave cheeseburger before i came over here no 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 this is a culinary masterpiece (laughs) it's so costco has these things and they're angus cheeseburgers and you they take four minutes to make these things and you pop it in the microwave, you open the bag, you pop it in the microwave, and four minutes later you have this cheeseburger. And I don't know how they do it, but it might not be, you know, the greatest bun on the planet. It's not something I'd, I wouldn't want to recreate it for my bakery. But the fact that they were able to create this thing, have it survive this whole process, and then you know, end up in my microwave for something fast to throw in. Pretty impressive. It's hugely impressive. You know, what Budweiser does with beer around the world is not the greatest beer in the world. I don't drink it anymore, but 
it's so impressive that consistency and that kind of quality mm-hmm. and you know that you a Budweiser tastes like a Budweiser all over the world so I'm impressed with that on our scale you know it's fun to be consistent um, but uh, I don't even know what the point was here the <laughs> um, yeah, I don't even remember what, what I was going after. I got distracted. I, I felt embarrassed to bring up my cheeseburger. But, <laughs> you know, it's 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 sustenance. And, and it is it does mean a lot to me that people can buy our bread. Now, a lot of people want more whole grain breads. And we're going to be mm-hmm. bringing more whole grain breads. But I'm not convinced that whole grain breads are everything they're m- made up to be like. If you understand the evolution of plants, plants create certain defense things. And some of those, yeah, I, I won't get off into it here, but a lot of what's in the whole gra- in the whole grain is there's anti-nutrients in there that actually draw nutrients out of your body. So mm-hmm. the fact, I believe that good bread made well with people, with good, by good people made in beautiful processes, especially sourdoughs and things like that, I believe that's healthy, good for you no matter what. I mean, I I don't mm-hmm. eat that much bread, oddly enough, because I'm around it so much. Mm-hmm. But when I do take a bag at home, it re- I can I usually eat the whole thing. I just can't okay. believe it. It's so, it's so incredible. Delicious. And a good baguette also feels good. It, 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 somehow it feels like I ate this whole thing, but it's almost like sushi. It just like, it doesn't fill me up when it's mm-hmm. good, well-made bread, right? So right. I don't know. There's all these mysteries around it. It keeps me, you know, it, it's enabled me to have, uh, it's healed me. It's gotten me through some tough times in my life. It's, uh, yeah, you know, I'm a night owl. I don't like, there's not a morning that the alarm goes off that I don't groan about it, which is a bad way to start. <laughs> That's good day. to hear. <laughs> I always right? wondered about that. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard for me. And then, but what it does is it leaves my afternoons open. And mm-hmm. so that enabled me to uh, study. I studied psychoanalysis for a while. It enabled me to work with birds. My son and I became falconers together and were able to fly birds. And that's a huge part of our lives. He's a professional falconer now. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, so it's a lot, it's just, it, and then it, it puts me in an interesting place in this community, right? I'm kind of the, you know, it's been interesting to know nobody in Helena moving here a year and a half plus ago and, and being the, you know, there's no other real bakeries in town that are making bread like this. And so to meet you at the airport and to meet people and to, people know me as the guy that makes that mm-hmm. baguette or whatever. And that's pretty satisfying. I mean, even though I've always just thought of it as my job so I could do what I really want to uh-huh. do, I'm starting to go, I, I, I'm actually a bread baker. There's something special right? about this. Yeah, well, that takes good. us full circle back to the beginning of our conversation, which was that when I met you and you told me what you do, that you were the one that created that baguette, that there was a celebrity status about that. Right. And, um, and that's what immediately became our connecting piece. And it's funny life. because everybody teases me at work, but I do feel like a rock star when I'm baking because like I'll, a lot of times if I had my way, I'd be blasting Van Halen um, when I'm baking <laughs> yeah. baguettes because I'm just, it, it's so gratifying and, and it's intense and it's like, I don't know. I just, I have so much fun doing it and there's a part of me that thinks when I bring those baguettes out, that the whole crowd should be out there cheering. <laughs> well, we should good, be. Right? I would be if I was there. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, those are. This is exactly what I had in mind when I asked you to be on my podcast. So I really appreciate your taking the time and sharing your stories. And thank you um, for having me. It's been a pleasure. It has been. And when uh, I for our listeners, I will have in the blog post associated with this podcast. You can look up some information about Rocky and what he does and the Park Avenue Bakery. And of course, if you ever get to Helena, Montana, you'll want to come by and say hello and eat the baguette in Park Avenue Bakery. And I'll also put in a link to Like Water for Chocolate, that scene that I mentioned. And if Rocky has anything else to share in terms of um, resources for you to start baking bread in your own home or 
consider different bakeries that you'd be interested in learning more about, I will include those resources. So thank you again for joining me. Well, thank you. And uh, be sure if you like this podcast to ask for part two in which we drink wine make bread and do that during the entire podcast. I think it'd be fun. Yes, we will. If definitely. there's enough demand for it. <laughs> we will definitely have to schedule that episode in the Great. very near future. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you for listening to your stories. Don't define you how you share them. Will. please visit my website for more podcast episodes, blog posts, and information about how I can help you develop and share your stories at elkinsconsulting.com. Could you tell me that you're going away?